Hello guys, I'm Lauren Smith and I'm studying a degree in theoretical physics. I'll be bringing you through to 2021's higher level question 5 today. Today's question is an experiment question to verify Joule's law. So, let's get going. So, looking at question 5, we are told that a heating coil is immersed in water and a constant current I was passed through. Now, this current I is going to be varied as you can see in this part of the data table here. And this current was allowed to flow for four minutes. That's the time period. I'm going to label that as T. And a rise in temperature was determined. The process was repeated for a different number of currents, as you can see from the data table. Um, and the mass of the water was kept constant at 105 grams. We're asked a couple of questions on this. So for part one in particular, because we're asked to draw a diagram, it is useful to read this little bur blurb of information up here always, because sometimes it, during with exam pressure and I include myself sometimes, it is very easy to just skip over this and just start answering questions. But this blurb of information can help you construct the experimental setup because we're told that the heating coil is immersed in water, which is a part of the diagram you will gain marks for. So let's actually look at the questions at hand. Okay, so in part one, we're asked to draw a labeled diagram. Note labeled. You will lose marks if you don't label your diagram. I think it is you lose one mark for every omitted label in the diagram for how this apparatus was arranged in this experiment. And here is a sample diagram. And as you can see, I've probably over labeled. I have loads of labels flying about here, but it is to drive home the point that it is very good practice to label as much as you can. So what will you get marks for? You will get marks for the ammeter, which is in series. If it is in parallel, you will not get marks because an ammeter is always in series with the circuit. In series basically means that if you take a part this part of the circuit here, including the ammeter, it will be a broken circuit. Okay, so the next bit of information and label you'll need is the power source, which gives you three marks. The next bit of information you will need is, of course, the rheostat or another way of varying the current in this experiment. Okay, so the rheostat varies the resistance of the circuit, not the resistance of the coil it down here, which remains constant as this is one of the requirements for Joule's law to hold. And for your final three marks, you'll need to either mention a thermometer or the coil in water. And either one of those will get you three marks. Having them both there though, it really does increase your chances of gaining as much marks as you can. So again, over label, really, really deck out your diagrams very well. It's amazing how many marks you can pick up. So moving on to part two, we are asked why was the current allowed to flow for a constant period of time? And we're told that this constant period of time is four minutes. The reason is as follows. So that the time is a constant value in the experiment and it's not a variable. So in other words, the experimental values are unaffected by this time parameter and it stays the same throughout the experiment. As in this experiment, we are looking at the change in temperature due to the heat energy emitted by a wire with a constant current passing through it. Now, this explanation will get you three marks. Before we start part three, I just want to draw your attention to the formula and tables book in particular to a couple of formulas we will use throughout this part to help us answer the question. On page 18, we will look at the equation of the line formula y equals mx plus c. On page 61, we will be looking at Joule's law, which shows that power is directly proportional to the current squared. Page 55, we will look at the expression for power. P is equal to work over time. And finally, page 58, where we will be looking at the energy needed to change temperature formula. In particular, the change in energy is equal to the mass times the specific heat capacity of the substance times the change in temperature. In part three, we're asked to draw a suitable graph to verify Joule's law. 
I've got a workings panel over here and also I've drawn out a brand new table which I've drawn out here which I'd recommend you to do in your exam booklets to make sure that you know exactly what values that you're going to put into your graph so that it is clear in your mind what points you're plotting. Just in the workings panel we know that power is directly proportional to the current squared. Now power by definition is equal to the work over the time and work is related to energy or the change in energy. So that means the change in energy is directly proportional to the current squared and we know from the formula change in energy is equal to mc delta theta that delta theta is directly proportional to the current squared. So what we need to find is delta theta which we have here and it's in degrees celsius so that's absolutely fine for the graph. I know degrees celsius isn't in SI units however since degrees celsius and kelvin only differ by 273.15 and that is constant it really doesn't matter if you put these values in degrees celsius or kelvin because putting these values in celsius will not affect the graph or the relation between that and the current. So we need to find the current squared or i squared. We only have i. So we're, I'm going to pick out a value say 1.5 here and I'm going to square it. So 1.5 squared is just 2.25 but I'm going to round it to 2.3. You can see here in both tables that the values are rounded to one decimal place so that's what we're going to do in our table always try and mirror the data that you're given and we're just going to do this for all the values by filling in this table correctly full of i squared values you're going to get three marks now to fully understand what's going on in the graph and what we need to do we know that the power is directly proportional to i squared this is joule's law which we saw in the formula tables book and this relates to power is equal to i squared or and or is the proportionality constant between these two values or being the resistance. We know that power is equal to work over time. Therefore, equating these two formula, we get that the total work is equal to or t i squared. We can put this into the form y is equal to m x plus c. We can already see that the y intercept or c is equal to zero. The x values will be the current squared values, but what is going to be y? Well, we know that work, as we said before, is directly correlated to energy or even the change in energy. It really doesn't matter. And we know that the change in energy is directly proportional to the current squared, as we saw earlier. And of course, the change in energy is equal to mc delta theta and delta theta is directly proportional to i squared. This is just reiterating what I said when we were going through the values for the data points. So we know that y is going to be delta theta. So all of our y values are gonna be the delta theta values. So therefore, this gives us a great advantage in drawing out our graph. This makes sense because i, or the current, is an independent variable as we are measuring the temperature change in response to the current we give to the system. The y-intercept information is key because we know that the graph must go through the origin, therefore the best fit line must go through the origin. Now let's move on to what does our graph actually look like? It will look a little bit like so. Now to get your full nine marks, which is what is given for this physical graph, you must make sure that your axes are labeled properly. Therefore, you need to give the proper variable names, for example, i squared in this case and delta theta. And you also need to include their units. For i squared, it is the ampere squared. And for delta theta, it is, of course, degrees Celsius. And finally, you must scale your graphs properly and evenly, as I've done here. And for this, you'll get your first three marks. In plotting the points correctly, which you see in magenta here, you'll get your next three marks. The line of best fit, which is in purple, will get you your next three marks. My tips for drawing a line of best fit would be that it must go through the origin as per the formula. We explained that earlier. Now, it is good practice to try and draw the line so that equal amounts of points are on either side of the line at equal distances from the line to even each other out to really get the true average of values. And please, please, please use a ruler. You will not get marks for a wonky best fit line. 
And just a little tip, it is also good practice and a good idea to add a title to your graph like I have done here. It doesn't have to be a very elaborate title, just something simple to let the examiner know which graph you have drawn because more than likely you will be drawing at least two graphs if not more in the exam and you don't want the examiner to get mixed up. So in finding this value of delta theta over i squared we're going to be looking at the slope formula in which slope is given by the letter m and it is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 as you can see here and just by copying this down from the hormone tables book gives you three marks so always 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 put down every single formula that you think is relevant or that you will use in your calculations because i will guarantee you you will pick up a big chunk of marks now each y point represents a value of delta theta and the change in y values will give roughly an average of delta theta. And the same goes in the same explanation for I squared. I squared represent values on the x-axis or the conventional x-axis. So a change in these values over um, a certain interval will get you roughly the average. So the slope in fact equals delta theta over I squared. Because again, we are looking for the average resistance as given by the question. So this is absolutely perfect to use. Now we're going to have to find two points on our best fit line. I wouldn't take points from the table because nine times out of ten, they will not be points directly on the graph. And we need points on the line of best fit to find the most accurate value for the slope. And what I'd first do is set x1, y1 to the origin. As we discovered in part three, the origin, as I'm just going to highlight in pink, as I'm just going to highlight in magenta here, will always be included in the line of best fit, given our analytic definition of this best fit line, as discussed in part three of this question. So this is a guaranteed point, so I'd always include it for convenience. Now you can pick any other point as long as it's on the best fit line because we need a second point for the slope. So for x2, y2, I've picked out the point 8 and 16.25. And one of my big tips would be to draw a dotted line from a point which of your choosing on the purple best fit line to each axis as you can see here and here just so you're pretty clear or a hundred percent clear in your head of your x and y values for that specific point and also to let the examiner know too so plugging this in we've given m is equal to y2 over x2 because y1 and x1 are both zero this is just equal to 16.25 over 8 which when you put into your calculator, it's roughly going to be 2.03. So delta theta over I squared is equal to 2.03. This value will give you three marks. Okay.